And then our next and final session is Friday, June 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and I will, I think with that, turn it back over to Meg. Great. So before we go around, I'll do uh, just a quick reading from my favorite book in the world, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. If one tree fruits, they all fruit. There are no soloists. Not one tree in a grove, but the whole grove. Not one grove in the forest, but every grove all across the county and all across the state. The trees act not as individuals, but somehow as a collective. Exactly how they do this, we don't yet know. But what we see is the power of unity. What happens to one happens to us all. We can starve together or feast together. All flourishing is mutual. But that was a nice reading as we talk about community partnerships and how we're all in this together. So I will do this modeling of calling on someone else as I finish and you introduce yourselves and then name somebody else to introduce themselves. And let's end with the people called conference who are actually our presenters today. And I'll say a word before they come in. So I'm gonna call on the person people called Eileen today. So you can unmute and introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, I'm Eileen. We're here at uh, Cleveland, uh, First Unitarian Church of Cleveland. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, and I'm Karen Groshaw, sitting next to Eileen. And now call on someone else. Oh, let's see. I guess we need, I think, the participants. I think we need, maybe, do we need a gal the gallery view to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah there we go. That'll make okay. it easier. Here we go. I call on you. Is that how I do that? Do I just click on them? Oh, no, if you just no, call just their name. Just my name. Oh, like Harvey. Harvey. I call on Harvey. I'm alive, so, uh, okay, so I think if you can hear us, say so. Yep, we got you. We've been messing with sound back here. I'm Harvey Harrison. We're First Unitarian Church in Des Moines. Um, I'm Dave Cohen, joining Harvey as well. And I don't see any names, which will be a little bit of a problem. Oh, you don't? Okay, let's call on Amanda. Amanda, yeah, now they're up there. Thanks. We're, uh, we're off mute now. Who would like to introduce us? Hi, I'm Debbie Crawford. Hi. You're not in the picture, though, so we know. Columbus, do you? Linda Smith, Columbus, do you? Pat Mariah, the first year you, Columbus. Can you both, Columbus? And I'm Amanda Hage. I'm an intern minister at First Year Columbus. Second. Oh yeah, who are we gonna pick on next? Um, how about conference? So let's, oh, let's save them for last. So, uh, let's go with Kath, Catherine. And then it should be in the lower left corner, Catherine. This is also good training for all of us to help us mute and unmute, as well as introductions. Do you see it? Okay. There you go. You got it. Okay. Um, there are two of us here from First Unitarian Church in Portland. Um, I'm Catherine Scotton. And I'm Elizabeth Wilbach. And I see we're really badly backlighted. We may try to circle around the table a little bit, but uh, is there anyone left for us to call on? Reverend Rob Gregson. Okay, Reverend, Reverend Rob. <laughs> I'm glad you asked because I was frantically scanning the list to see who I was supposed to call on next. Uh, Rob Gregson, I am the executive director of UU Faith Action New Jersey, the Sands in New Jersey. And I don't see any member of my team here, so it's me. Great. And then finally, we have the team called Conference, which I think is a conference room that 
Adam and Al Gerhardstein have in their law office and they have a special guest. So I'll have you introduce her. Good afternoon, this is Maris Harold, and she is the Chief of Police at the University of Cincinnati Police Department. Uh, the university uh, traditionally has had about 70, or lately has had about 70 officers. And uh, she spent over 20 years as a police, uh, rising up to the ranks up to captain at the Cincinnati Police Department. And she is a national and international expert on problem solving, uh, using problem solving to address public safety issues. And she's gonna open up with us today uh, to talk some about the engagement of the community as, uh, as, a, as a tool uh, to promote public safety while keeping arrests uh, as low as possible and building trust. So should we get rolling? Yeah, so I think we'll, Great, thank you. I think what we'll do is um, we'll start with a dialogue between uh, Alan Maris and talking a little bit about um, their history, uh, um, bringing police reform to Cincinnati and then uh, more recently the University of Cincinnati, and um, with a focus on uh, the role that community leaders can play in, in, in helping uh, bring that uh, reform. And then we'll have an opportunity for people to ask questions, and then after that, Maris is going to um, head out, and we'll have an opportunity to uh, have some discussion uh, amongst ourselves and answer some of your questions that are very particular to the work you've been doing because I know we're about midway through this series and you guys have been doing a lot of work and so now uh, my dad and I want to um, be a resource to you and help answer your questions in a way that'll help everybody who's part of the webinar series. So with that. Okay, well, thank you. So, you know, part of the reason, Maris, that you're here is that I wanted to help reassure people that there are police officials out there who may welcome uh, community members trying to get involved in public safety. And I thought maybe we'd start by just asking you what the difference is in the way you try to establish policing philosophy at the University of Cincinnati Police Department now and what you were working toward at the Cincinnati Police Department versus when you started. Um, well, that's a great question. So when I first started, uh, Policing was completely reactive. Um, we did not ask the community for input to solve problems. Um, we told the community uh, what we were going to do. Um, we weren't transparent with our strategies. Um, we were kind of like the big brother, big sister in the room. Um, people really didn't understand crime. Uh, the police chiefs and the executives, when I came on, didn't believe they could control crime. And so over the last couple decades, obviously crime has become a science. We know that what police and the community do can have huge impacts on crime. And we understand the power of new technologies, um, which weren't around um, when I came on in 1993. Um, but more important, like the biggest thing was that police officers were tied to a radio they were told to respond rapidly into these situations, take control as quickly as possible, use whatever force was necessary to take control. Um, and so the strategies that come to mind when you ask that question were, when I first came on, were zero tolerance strategies. So we felt like we were an invading army into communities um, where, um, and these were the terms that were used when I first came on, were uh, zero tolerance, arrest everything that moves, it doesn't matter who is getting arrested. We have plenty of jail space. Um, and this is what the community wants, whether they say it or not. Okay, and so how is it different um, now? <clears throat> well, you know, in my career in the city of Cincinnati, so I think one of the first things that I thought was innovative, I mean, and this was after the collaborative. So <clears throat> after we had the civil unrest in the early 2000s, um, I was put in charge of just reading, reading um, and understanding that there is a tremendous amount of research on the science of crime. And um, so once I started getting an understanding and the executive team started to understand that they could control crime, 
So there's a few fundamentals with crime science um, that I remember reading about and I was fascinated. That crime isn't random, that people aren't going around randomly and harming each other, victimization isn't random, um, and places where these crimes occur are not random. On top of that, and, and probably more important, that crimes cluster in these small geographic locations across any city, and this is international science, um, and that similar types of crimes cluster. Um, and that if you believe in that fundamental science, which I think has been proven internationally by just about any crime scientist, um, you really have to start intellectualizing those principles. And once you start believing that, then you have to ask yourself, why in the world are the police policing the way they police? If we, through data and problem solving and research that we know who the offenders are, who the, the worst of the worst are, where, where the crime is being committed, and you understand the repeat victimization problem, why are we just rapidly responding to a 911 system? That I have to say, at the same time, that once you understand the aggregate da data in decades of police calls, the majority of police calls aren't even involving something the police can handle. That's important for the community to understand too. And I think there'll be a lot of new literature coming on, out on that, that a tremendous amount of calls for service to the police don't involve police, right? And so the community should understand these basic principles. Then we've had tremendous amount of technology advancements. Can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm missing some of you your words um, and some keywords. I wonder if there's a microphone that could get a little closer or something. I don't know if other people are, but some of some of the ends of your sentences are falling off and they seem like really important words you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to speak up. <clears throat> yeah, did you say that you calls that are coming in that um, are actually not helpful, for, that are not police calls, but there are other types of calls? I didn't catch what types you were saying. So if you, if you would look at all, all the police calls that come into a 911 center, there are a tremendous amount of those calls for service that people are not asking for police service. In other words, the police aren't in the best position to solve what the caller is calling for. And so the community should be aware of that. There is a, if, you, if you would look at any daily sheet of the calls for service, you could probably take about 25% of those out that aren't police related. But the community is trained to use that 911 system to get the police to respond. What are examples of those? Uh, educational concerns. Um, I'm big in uh, educational concerns, um, mental health concerns, um, you know, dis uh, disobedience, uh, children concerns that are parenting concerns that are more driven uh, by social workers in the field. So I could go on and on, um, but it's it, the volume of calls that really do not require police expertise are, are, are a lot. And I don't wanna give you a stat because I'm not, I'm not every city's gonna be a little bit different. So Maris, uh, what we're doing <clears throat> is meeting with these people across the country for the purpose of helping them connect with their local law enforcement agencies and in a constructive way, offer ideas, suggestions, strategies that will build trust, uh, reduce reliance on reactive policing, and build ideas and plans for uh, ways to, to keep peace um, in an integrated and, and, and uh, cooperative way. Um, and people are going to have all types of pushback. And what, as a, as a person who's been in the reactive policing world and is now in uh, this different world, uh, what is your advice for folks like this on how best to approach uh, their own department and how best to be helpful to them? Yeah, so I think, I think the best thing to do is have dialogue with police executives on larger concepts. Um, what is the primary strategy of the police division? Is it traditional model of policing? Um, is it a data-driven agency? So if you look across the country, usually big 
municipalities are data driven. That means that they're looking at their data in real time or at least on a 24 hour cycle. Um, that the uh, strategy that they've taken is uh, you, you would want to push for some type of preventative uh, strategy, which there's different varying types, but I think any strategy that falls under the umbrella of problem solving, which is collaboration with the community, which is using some type of problem solving model to look at data with the community and decide what a proper response for the problem is. And I think most importantly is that your police department understand that we are talking at the end of the day that a small number of offenders are committing crime, a smaller number of places are where the crimes occur, and that there's a huge repeat victimization problem in this country that is seldom dealt with. So if you were gonna ask me, I would start dialogue with any police executive asking those fundamental questions. Okay, well, what questions do you have of Maris as a, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a progressive uh, police <laughs> official? This is Jennifer Tracy from Portland. Um, when you're talking about tracking, you know, are they using data-driven, you know, measures and tracking crime? Um, are you, what is the best way to do that based on arrests or based on 911 calls or based on other information? And I ask that because my concern is when there is a, a disparity of arrests of people of color, even though they may not be the ones committing the crimes all the time, you know, and then there's a lack of arrests of people that aren't people of color committing crimes. Um, do, can you just give any, any feedback on that in terms of how that's being measured? Yeah, so when I talk of data-driven strategies, that could probably mean it's endless on what you could look at. You're not just looking at crime data, but you're looking at um, what I call environmental criminology. It's the conditions in any given location um, that create opportunities for crimes to be committed. So if you just kind of think about crime, like the way I told you before, that if we believe in crime science, then we're looking at crime more to prevent crime and not just respond. So we're not looking at things all the time in, that happened in the past, but we're looking at the environments at these locations um, that allow crime to take place. And that can be, uh, the research on that is just, that, that would take a whole nother day. Um, but I urge you to look at um, the research on situational crime prevention, um, which really, talks about um, what environments create these opportunities for crime to occur in the first place and how to block those before they occur. I'm passionate about that. Um, I think more police departments should train and understand that um, because I really believe that the majority of crime that we see is very preventable. Um, and it, once you understand the places that crime occurs, uh, then, then you really start really hitting on all cylinders about crime prevention. And really, if you look historically at what the police were supposed to do, you know, they were supposed to prevent crime and work with the community. Unfortunately, that's just not the way police, uh, police communities. And we have to get back to that. And I think that if you do one thing, there's a couple things. Look up situational crime prevention. Um, there's a huge model. It's a tool. Uh, the community can understand it. Help police departments. It doesn't involve arrest. That's not the primary response. It's about blocking opportunities for crime. I've done it in a, hundreds of places here in the city. It works. Um, and then I would look up a couple theories of crime. Uh, rational choice and routine activities theory. And those theories really talk um, in great detail about the science of policing and how we should police differently in this country. And they're not radical. <laughs> they're, they just make sense from a science perspective. Okay, other questions? Uh, this is Rob Gregson uh, in New Jersey. Thanks very much for joining us. I really appreciate you spending this time with us. My question is about um, the overall uh, rubric of community policing. Is that 
is that the way a way to go? Is that language to be used? Uh, is that still au courant? And I guess relatedly, um, how do you feel about community relation, police relations boards as a way of trying to bridge this gap? Uh, do they work? And how do I guess what are the best ways to have them work? And what are some really bad ways that they work? That's a great question. Um, so. In the city of Cincinnati, we struggled, they still struggle with the concept of having the community have some type of leverage or some type of relationship as it relates to police strategy. I think the way the University of Cincinnati, after that uh, tragedy with Sam DeBose happened, the shooting, I think the way that UC set up their police community relations board um, has been fantastic. Um, so they have members from the faith, uh, the community, uh, social service agencies, doctors from UC, faculty, student representatives, and they kind of hold us accountable for all of the police reforms that we're doing. Um, but I can tell you that it's been one of the most successful things I've ever been involved with. It's run by a judge, a retired judge, um, and they hold us accountable. But the cool thing is, is I've invited them to do everything that the police do as far as training and education. Um, and it changes the way that we both look at each other, which is so important. So um, just to give you one example, um, we have a gentleman at UC, Dr. Abercrombie, and I'll be just honest, and he would tell you the same thing. He just did not like police when he um, started this process with us. Um, and we just, involved him. I put him on my training committee. I told him he has to come to training, use of force training, all of our tactical training. And I'll tell you what, at the end of those trainings, he had a much different perspective um, on what we were trying to do. And he's become one of our biggest advocates. So I think that's so important to do for the police and the community to understand what we're, we're both doing. I have a different, I have a totally different respect level for Dr. Abercrombie. Um, and it's like we're all we're all friends now and that's what it's supposed to be we're supposed to be these partners in all of this and I think sometimes the police shove the community out um, and I don't know why because when I look at what we're doing at UC I want them to see what we're trying to do to change a culture of policing um, and the police for the most part I'm not gonna say every one of them but I'm gonna say the majority of them once they get the big picture and once they know what leadership wants then they want to do the right thing. They want to be progressive. They want to be innovative. Um, so I would strongly recommend that you have some type of board. And what about the question of this term, community policing? Um, oh, yeah. Does that help or is that a mushy term? Is problem solving more specific? Uh, what do you get out of that? Yeah, I'm not, the research just, the research just isn't very supportive of the concept of community policing. Now, I'm not going to say that we shouldn't be involved in community policing or community-oriented policing. What I would strongly suggest, though, is that you really focus in on the science of problem solving. Um, because I could send cops out every day to do grill outs in the neighborhoods. I could send cops out every day to play basketball with kids. I could send cops out to talk to students for 10 hours a day. But at the end of the day, I think the community is much more concerned if they're helping the police work on significant problems in their community and solving them and, and preventing these crimes from happening. And there's little research to suggest that community policing actually prevents crimes from happening um, or solves problems at the end of the day. And so I'm much more interested as a police executive um, in the science of policing um, and if you're doing problem solving, legitimate problem solving, you're forced into a relationship with the community to solve that problem. And community policing does not have any of those attributes. Now, I think it falls under the umbrella of community policing, I mean, uh, under the umbrella of problem solving, um, but it's one facet of problem solving. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Harvey. Am I unmuted? Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the morning, uh, what I want to understand is how to ask the Des Moines Police Department the question of whether or not they're doing problem-solving policing, 
and tie into that whether or not they are they have identified the kinds of locations that you're talking about um, in your work. They talk about hotspot policing. They're, they refer citizens like myself to a website that shows um, some areas where they've gone and done work in the last 90 days and then those disappear. Those are almost entirely not useful to the work we're doing. So I'm curious of what, what questions should I be posing? So, um, you know, hotspot policing um, has been very effective across a lot of cities. Um, so obviously, if you put a cop in a hotspot, you're probably going to have success for a limited amount of time, right? And I think that New York City, Philadelphia, some of these big cities that have done hotspot policing, Camden, New Jersey, have showed really great reductions in violent crime. Um, the problem is, is what happens when the cop walks out of that hotspot? Um, so what I'd be interested in, in any type of focused policing in a small geographic area is what is the police officer in the community doing to solve the problems that, and so if you're not, if you don't understand situational crime prevention, all you're doing is putting a cop on a dot and driving crime down for a limited amount of time and then that crime's going to come right back. So what is the cop in the community doing in that hot spot is much more important. So are they working with uh, landlords to make sure that they are blocking opportunities for crimes to exist? Are they improving uh, the community's life in these hot spots? Are they making the community less fearful? Is the community identifying problems that they want fixed? Um, are they working with all city departments to understand all of these opportunities for crime in hot spots? Those are the kind of questions if a police executive says we're doing hot spot policing, because that's just about a tenth of what should be occurring. Um, in that small geographic location. So what, what I'm hearing is that hotspot policing can be traditional reactive policing. You simply use the, the computer to identify where the crime's occurring and then you go in and arrest people on the dot. And what Maris is challenging us to do is ask the question is why is that a hotspot? And what can I do to make it not be a hotspot? And that's where she gets into talking to the other agencies, talking to the landlords, engaging the contiguous people that, that have property nearby, which she's done a lot of work on in various areas across the city. So that's an important distinction. Is that fair? Oh, that's a great summary, yes. All right, what else? Thank you much. I have two questions. Uh, this is Debbie Crawford in Columbus. Um, I'm You've been studying, so that's Can you speak up, please? Um, Get closer to the microphone, Debbie. Sorry. Just so, so, Chief, you've been studying. So, um, PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, they did this huge report on what lessons, what lessons in other countries have been learned. And my question is, did you have any big takeaways from that that you can talk about that they're doing in other countries um, other than the United States? And then my second question is, Columbus Mayor just started a, a commission similar to what you're describing in Cincinnati. And I was wondering, they're looking for speakers. And I was wondering if you would consider coming to Columbus since we're two hours up the hill and uh, maybe talking to the group, because I think so much can be learned. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, if you send me the details, I'll see if I can fit it into my schedule. Second, PERF. Um, I think they're doing some of the most innovative research in the country. I was just uh, in DC to, um, for one of their forums. But I can tell you something, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because here's something else I'm passionate about that I'm just getting into, if you don't mind. Go, go ahead. Get off of the problem solving for just one second. And it's something that you should really talk to your police executives about. I've been all over talking about this. Um, and this is called the uh, critical decision-making model. Um, and uh, PERF sent a bunch of police executives and researchers to U UK, um, I just, stop. I brought it, brought it up to our attention and now we're going to. Shoot. Uh, she might, she might go ahead. So, um, 
they focused in on Scotland. Um, and I'll just try to briefly give you an overview of this because I think this type of strategy with use of force is probably one of the most revolutionary ideas that I've seen in policing um, since problem solving. Um, and if you, you can research this on your own, if you go to the PERF website, it's called the ICAT model, that's I-C-A-T. Um, but basically, here's the gist of it. Um, have you ever noticed across the country how rare it is for SWAT personnel to get involved in one of these shootings of unarmed black men? Um, if you look across the country, it's very rare when SWAT engages in one of these uh, deadly forces. And so Scotland kind of has studied that model, um, and they've taken a lot of concepts from this, and they've trained their police officers in this critical decision-making model. And basically what the model is teaching the officers is to slow down in time and space. Um, we train patrol officers totally different in this country than we tra train elite officers. Elite officers, everything is time and distance. Everything is bringing additional resources to a scene. And everything at the end of the day, from a SWAT perspective, is everybody's going to go home. That is the first thing you'll hear every SWAT commander across this country say on a SWAT call out. Everybody's going to go home today. Even the suspect. The suspect. So if you go to a roll call across this country, and especially when I was a young officer, the message was, the important thing was, you go home today safe. The cop goes home today safe. So the CDM model has taken what we've trained SWAT teams and put in, putting in the middle of the model the concept of the sanctity of life. And if you're constantly thinking about the sanctity of all human life, and you're using the tactics of SWAT personnel that I'm gonna put time, distance, I'm gonna call additional resources, whether that's psychiatrists, medical, um, whatever that resource is that you need, I really truly believe you're not gonna have these situations that we continually see across this country of shooting of unarmed black men. And um, so I've been through the training um, we're bringing it to uh, UC. Um, so I just think it's really important to start pushing this out to police agencies because it works. I've seen it work. I've, on, I've been on hundreds of SWAT call outs. There's a total difference. Um, and just let me end this with this. When I was a young officer, when bad things happened, you were trained no matter what, you were gonna be the first on the scene you were going to take control of that situation and you were going to use whatever force was necessary and escalate that. When you were met with force, <clears throat> you were going to overcome that by more force. The CDM model does not, it does not train officers that way. In fact, it trains them just the opposite. So do some research on that because I, I do think, and I'm passionate about it, I think it'll save lives. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead, Meg. So thanks so much. I'm, I'm inspired listening to you. And this might be an annoying question, but you mentioned Samuel Bowes. And I just wonder what went wrong there. I mean, you were doing these practices already, right? So no, this, came, this has come out of that crisis. Yeah, so um, I've been at UC um, almost two, two years. This happened um, a year before I got there. Um, and we entered into a voluntary compliance, which I believe we are still the only police department in the country that entered into this uh, uh, voluntary compliance with an outside uh, agency um, that provided UC with 276 recommendations of fundamental police reform. <clears throat> um, I could go on and on about UC story. Um, it's an important story. No, that's helpful. I didn't understand that this came out of that. So uh, that's, that's very helpful. That, that situation is a prime example of what goes wrong with police departments across the country. They went on a hiring spree um, in 2014 to 15. Um, they hired, uh, I believe, all male whites very rapidly um, without sufficient training. And then they picked a strategy 
um, of heavy traffic enforcement in areas that they should not have been doing uh, heavy enforcement of traffic stops. So it went horribly awry. Um, the officer was tactically not sound on numerous fronts. Um, and this is why I'm passionate about that model. Because if this officer would have been trained in that model and been held accountable for this model, that incident would not have happened. Can I ask one more question? We, we read a lot about white supremacists joining police forces. And I wonder what, what kind of training could mitigate against blatant racists who are there. Do you think that's overstated or have you had experience where you, I just, I read about that often and I, I wonder the truth you see. I think the truth is, is you gotta be very careful how you recruit police officers. And this is, this is what I know. People have biases, but if you have a strong executive team that is passionate about the strategy and involves the community, um, Police, just like the military, are going to do, for the most part, what their leaders expect. I believe that. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, police officers are police officers for one reason. They want to follow. And they want to feel like they're doing good work. If you have a bad police executive with a bad strategy, then you're going to have a police force that follows that police executive. Um, I've seen it personally here in Cincinnati. I've seen people change in Cincinnati. Now I'm saying when they go home, are they great people? I don't know. I know that I've seen great work um, done by officers that I would have never expected that before. I have a question. Thanks. Um, so I've taken the deposition of a number of uh, police executives mm -hmm. and I haven't heard any of them talk about situational crime prevention or rational choice theory or routine activity theory or the sanctity of human life. And what can community members do to get their police executives to start either talking about these things if they already know about them, or learning about them if they, um, they don't know about them, or implementing them uh, once they learn about them? I mean, how do you, how do you break in? Um, that's a tough question. So I do believe that, at least in major cities, police chiefs, if they're gonna get hired, they have to understand these principles, uh, or else I don't see a lot of police chiefs getting hired in, in today's, uh, you know, today's environment. However, you have to keep in mind the majority of police departments are small, and there's no expectation for, for this type of thinking. Um, they've never, They've never been expected to um, really deploy this way. And there's a multitude of reasons for that. But what I, what I would offer is this. First, police community boards, relationship boards are awesome. And then try to get to a place where you're conducting interviews with the police executives that are being promoted and hired. And you know, one thing the city of Cincinnati did very well um, is they partnered with an academic partner you know, Dr. John Ack. We're, we're lucky here in Cincinnati. We have uh, a couple of really solid doctors that have authored a lot of this literature. But every city has a university. Um, so partnerships with academics are wonderful. And then I would expect that to get promoted in any city that you have a fundamental understanding of the principles of problem solving and situational crime prevention. Um, those are pretty basic. Um, and then I'm a big believer in, in college. Um, military and college, I think, just brings um, a little bit more uh, sophistication and understanding of inclusion. Does that answer your question, I know? So college education, is it? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big person that believes that, you know, especially if the college specializes, like you see in some type of crime prevention, some type of crime science, um, you know, when I was working for the city of Cincinnati, we had the scholars program where we would send our police officers a handful um, every year um, to get a expedited or what's a better word, uh, a, a year master's degree, an accelerated uh, degree um, in crime science. And I can tell you that made a huge difference um, in the, the basic, you know, the understanding, the fabric uh, at least you had, you know, 
uh, a dozen, couple dozen people that understood these concepts. So hear what she just said. Um, big focus on the paramilitary nature of policing and the importance of leadership. So you realize that when you get a new chief in your town, that is an excellent opportunity to make sure that you get involved in the standards that are going to be used to select that chief and the screening that would be used because with the chief comes the philosophy and and that's a big deal and that's a great opportunity to move uh, light years ahead in terms of the type of philosophy your department may have. Uh, maybe one more question and then uh, Maris has done her duty. <laughs> I have a question. If, sure. If, if perhaps ask the second one. Um, so on a number of occasions, I've heard Columbus police officers refer to suspects as bad guys. Um, and this is really disturbing to me. I'm curious, like your perspective on how like normal that is or, or how, what we can do to shift um, the police's perspective to a more like restorative view? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, that's been a part of policing since I came on. I'm sure it was a part of policing for decades. Um, it still goes on. Um, what I can suggest is that, you know, I always try to maintain a professional uh, environment. I don't tolerate that kind of talk. Here's the, here's the main point, and this is why crime science is so important, and you have to challenge police, and I do it all the time. I don't know how many times I still hear police officers say that's a bad neighborhood. It drives me insane. Um, because if you understand crime science, you understand really uh, an area that has, you know, historically has been called a bad neighborhood, it comes down to probably two or three street segments that are truly uh, deserving of police attention. The rest of the whole neighborhood has little or no problems whatsoever. It's the same with people. <laughs> and so if you understand that just a small number of these guys are truly violent and truly need to uh, be detained or arrested or put in the system, then why are we saying this about people? And so I just, if you understand the science, you really, you can challenge these guys. And once they understand the science, then they stop thinking that way. And I tell you, every presentation that I've given in the last, I don't know, seems like forever, maybe 10 years, I have really challenged people to stop saying we have a problem neighborhood. No, we don't. There's no neighborhood that's problematic. It's a street segment. It might, here's my thing, it's probably just a bad, one bad apartment complex, and when you look at the data at that apartment complex, I guarantee you that you'll find it's just probably one bad unit um, that has problems in it. So once you understand that, it's really hard to allow people to talk like that around you. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful, thank you. Okay, well thank you very much, Chief, I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks everybody. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be in touch, okay? Thank you very much. Well, I hope you found that helpful. Yeah, Al, I wondered if you, I think you had something to do with that case, the Samuel Bowes case, didn't you? Yeah, I represented the family. Uh, could, so, could you maybe describe it, what you did after that, or were you going to well, anyway? Because family was uh, was very very dedicated to the broad picture. Uh, so we did secure. He had like fourteen children. Uh, he was shot off campus, uh, almost a mile and a half away from campus. Um, he was not engaged in any violent activity. It was a uh, license plate that was missing is the ruse that was used to stop him. There was a, a very provable uh, pattern of discriminatory uh, traffic stops, which the chief had uh, hinted at. Uh, he was the worst perpetrator of all those traffic stops. Their metric for a good police officer at the time 
that the UC Police Department was the most arrests. So he was looking for <clears throat> people to arrest. It was a, a warped way to do law enforcement. And when Sam refused to get out of the car because he was afraid, uh, the officer reached in, Sam uh, put his foot on the gas pedal, but it was also on the brake. The officer claimed that his life was in danger when all he needed was to step away, uh, and he shot Sam in the head. Uh, and the officer was criminally charged with murder, uh, was tried twice, and was acquitted. We have since taken the case to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we haven't heard you back yet whether there'll be uh, a federal prosecution. But in the midst of our resolution of the civil case, uh, we secured like three and a half million plus free tuition for all the kids, plus uh, support for this uh, very dramatic set of police reforms. And, uh, and I agree with the chief, this is the most comprehensive redo of a police department uh, that didn't involve a court order that I've ever seen. And they're very serious about it. And they're very accountable and they're very transparent. I mean, I get these reports and I get to, she's invited me to go to all these trainings and to stay up on it and, and to stay engaged so that the police department remains um, uh, a beacon for, for reform. But all of that is post to both. And uh, they've got a whole new leadership, a whole new philosophy and it was a very fast turnaround. And it, it's, it's exciting to see that that can happen. Um, the, the chief was fired as part of the cleanup after that terrible, terrible event. Yeah. What's next? Um, well, a follow-up on what we just heard. So um, when the DeBose shooting happened, Maris was still at the city of Cincinnati. And, um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Dad, uh, when she started, she described the culture there, and, um, and that may be, the culture in some of these cities may be closer to that than it is to what she's describing at UC. And there wasn't always a time when you would have had a police officer you could invite to come and talk like that uh, from your local community. So how did you get to the point where you had strong relationships with police officers that you trusted and could come in and, and, and talk like that? I mean, how do you get from point A to point B? Yeah, I mean, it's years of persistent work. It's staying at the table. Um, in my case, of course, I sue people, so it's several lawsuits and and staying vigilant about uh, demanding broader relief than just money and then walking away. Um, the collaborative itself uh, requires a lot of uh, maintenance um, and therefore it was important to just stick with it. Like one of the, I was just talking about the metric for the UC police officers, the metric for Cincinnati police officers includes uh, there's no criteria for arrest, but it includes showing that you're a good problem solver. And how do you even measure that? You have to, you have to remind people that that's part of our uh, revised metric for performance and you have to stay at it. And we have uh, had varying success at, at keeping everybody focused on all of this in Cincinnati. But I think uh, Maris pointed out one thing that I actually hadn't focused on as, as clearly as she just said it. And that is the ongoing relationship between uh, police leadership and academic partners. Uh, she's right, the, the biggest um, and the most open people to change have been those that have gone through the um, uh, opportunities to get that fast track master's degree in crime science because they don't need to be convinced anymore. They aren't being asked to wiggle their ears. They're all uh, convert, converts to this broader philosophy. And there's been nothing, you know, the, the people that I've gotten the closest to are the people that have gone to those programs and, and you know, accepted those broader and more progressive philosophies, and then we can start talking. Um, 
but I think that's also just staying at the table and being there through thick and thin uh, so that you have ups and downs together like any friendship. Um, and that's, that's important to building trust. So um, I hope all that um, beginning of the session was helpful. Um, what, where we're at now in the bigger picture of the webinar is the first session uh, we talked about the big picture of policing and the assignment was to go and familiarize yourself more with how your community is policed. Uh, and your homework after the last session was to go out and start having conversations and building relationship with other community members who are doing uh, police reform work. And, um, and that brings us to today. I got some emails from some of you who went out and had those conversations with some very interesting takeaways. Um, and I know everybody's at varying places in their work. Um, we don't have a, a big agenda for this uh, webinar or for the next one because my thinking was you would be at the place by now where you would have your own questions, you would be identifying your, the, the needs of the community and would be able to bring uh, those questions and strategies to these uh, webinars for us to um, work with you on and to reframe so that hopefully they would be helpful to a broader group. And so my question is, uh, after for those of you who went out and had those conversations, and I know the Columbus group did, and I don't know if anybody's here from Montgomery County, um, but uh, what was, um, what was a takeaway or a question that you had uh, from that homework assignment that, that you'd like to raise and, and have us speak to? Um, this is Debbie Crawford. I'll talk from Columbus and anybody else can chime in. I'll just give, give my take, even though we did have some dialogue about it. We're, um, can you talk louder, please? Sure. How's that? Better? Yeah. Better. We're uh, four, sometimes five white women, um, and uh, we've decided, uh, I think, after working with activists, local activists, especially African-American activists that have been at this for some of them 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to act as a research arm, and we're going to do whatever it is um, we can to help them in their decisions about what they're going to do, and in the interim, uh, we're going to take what we've learned from you and tell about everybody we possibly can about it. And we're also going to try and get in front of this commission that Columbus just started. And we're going to hopefully bring in incredible people like Merrill to make sure they get in front of this commission. And um, we've already made safe several data requests, but we're just in a little different spot with the, with the newly developed, new developed newly appointed commission. So my takeaway was uh, I want to figure out to get what you've learned in front of people, but it's not going to be the straight line that I thought it was going to be. Well, you, you said a couple of really important things there. Number one, I love the partnering, uh, finding a way for uh, your skills and talents to really plug in and serving as sort of a research arm to somebody who's maybe better situated to do the activism, as long as you stay engaged and, and close to them so that you're meeting their needs. I love that. I think that's a really good way to be credible and, and supportive of them. Uh, but tell us a little bit more about the commission and it's who appointed it, what's its scope, and how do you know it's not just a sham? <laughs> We don't. Well, we have a, if you don't know, we have a, um, a monopoly on Democrats that run the whole city here. And I think there's a lot of progressives that think we're in, we're in good stead, when in fact, I think we're closer to Merrill's description of the early policing model than the science-based policing model. The mayor just appointed an 11-member commission will be tasked in Columbus for looking at training, policies and procedures. The commission will be asked to re recommend uh, a consultant to work with them. And um, we were very pleased that they put on this commission two or three longtime activists, one of whom, Tammy um, Fournier-Alsada, who was one of our leaders 
at a takeover city council meeting where we where she basically lost her cool and took over the council meeting for two hours and she's on the commission and um i think it remains to be seen what's going to happen another another breakthrough is the mayor has buffed the police union and the police rules and he now has it changed so that he can replace our current chief with a, someone from outside the current force, which is a new development and that was a big rule change. Okay, well that's very important. And those are the types of, of opportunities uh, that do give you um, an, a, a chance to make a big dent in the philosophy of the policing. So the way that you can make sure it's not a sham is to really yourselves take it seriously and engage and plug away at it and make sure city council listens. Um, you know, this has all been done both at the national level with the 21st century report from Obama's uh, era. And then at the state level, uh, we had just three years ago in Ohio, an extensive uh, statewide report on police reform. So there's plenty of, of fresh, current thinking that's been cataloged and, and reviewed, at least in Ohio. Um, and I'll just tell you, I'd be happy to meet with any one of those people on the commission to, um, to make sure that no one spins their wheels and that they get uh, connected. And I can hook them up with Maris. Thank you. And as a follow up to that, I thought about putting together a little PowerPoint of what I've learned and what you've been teaching us. Just just some of the basics like the three numbers, number one civil rights violations that you all see is false arrest, um, abuse of force and lack of quality medical care in, in jail. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's that's right. Um, I'll warn you that we currently have a a large number of cases against the Columbus police. So we're probably not the best uh, people to come and lecture them directly. But we can certainly be helpful to those who want uh, to find out what we're learning. Great. So and let's, let's stay in touch. Well, and to follow up on what you said earlier about institutions that line up with um, universities, it's been my understanding that Columbus does not play well with others and does not really think they need to know or learn anything from anybody else. It's been a consistent pattern here, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna be on us to force, to force that, because I think the people who seek out university partnerships are already 50% of the way there, you know, if you think Perfect. you have something to learn. So make sure, either in Columbus or if anybody else is involved in something like a commission, that the product that's demanded is not only uh, think thought pieces and learnings, but recommendations, so that that'll give you a handle for action afterwards. Thank you. Yes, we have a hand up from Ellen. Sorry. Muted here. Okay, so my question is, um, Columbus brought up the issue of the police union, and I was hoping you could give us just a little bit of context for that. Um, I know that in Cleveland, repeatedly, it has been a problem that the union has been able to overturn um, attempts by the city to rein in um, officers who have used excessive force. How does a city get in that situation that the police union is so powerful? So all these unions have uh, arbitration as the ultimate way they, they resolve disputes over discipline. And the police union wisely retain lawyers that have great institutional memory. And they know all the arbitration rulings, they know all the the historical discipline, they can tell you who back in 1950 was fired for this and who back in 1980 was fired for this. And the city, on the other hand, gives union disputes to the cub lawyers in their law department who have no institutional memory and might be able to understand legally what they're supposed to do, but don't have the uh, 
experience with the arbitrators who are longtime people for the most part, or knowledge of the rulings in a visceral type of way uh, to overcome the uh, power and influence of the police union lawyers. So at so one level, it's just this basic disparity in legal power. And we had that problem in Cincinnati. And one way the city overcame it is that they hired out all their arbitrations to a labor law firm that took the job seriously and fought on equal basis with the union lawyers and succeeded in getting some people fired that needed to be fired. And unless you're willing to apply the resources as a city so that you actually put the money behind the effort to get rid of people that need to go, uh, you'll feel like you're trapped because you are trapped. And, and that's a problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, I have a couple of things. Line. I Go ahead. The conversations you've had, I've been doing that for several years as a part of several community based organizations. That part wasn't new. The things that we've run into at this point, both good and bad, um, I filed in the last fall two requests for information under the Freedom of Information Act. We're still working on that. And I've retained a law firm to help me prepare the pleadings. So probably in early June, we'll file a motion to compel in the Polk County District Court. Um, that will impair my relationship with the police department, I suspect. Um, we also, the Des Moines Human Rights Commission, at the request of one of the groups that I work with, is about to set up a Kettering Institute model of facilitated circle conversations uh, for the month, and it will include public officials, police department, activist organizations, and citizens. It'll be interesting to see where those go. Um, the part of what's interesting in this conversation is one of the focus questions will talk about a preference for community policing. Uh, and since I'm going to be a part of the first one with the county attorney and the police chief, uh, it'll be interesting to see how I can frame that differently in the stuff to talk about today. So that's going on. Um, we've got one nice thing that happened just last week. In the middle of 2016, the Iowa legislature um, put in, uh, ended, excuse me, put back in place juvenile conf confidentiality, uh, which was a good thing. The unintended consequence was one of the community-based organizations that I worked with, which had been working with the Des Moines Police Department on juvenile court diversion got blocked. Uh, we just got a, legislation was passed by both houses this last week. So we should be back in business uh, with the Des Moines Police Department. That's one way to build a relationship. It was a very successful program until it got stopped. Um, my main question right now, one that's been very helpful, as I said, on community-based policing, it gives me a new framework for the, this upcoming Human Rights Commission meetings. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm not stumped because I know I'm gonna move ahead with it, but it is really frustrating on the opacity of the Des Moines Police Department and how much delay they have put in with the records requests and such. So I'm curious as to what your experiences were with that and have been. So, we have a local uh, media outlet that's pretty aggressive and they, they bring public record lawsuits all the time. And we have a very robust public records law in Ohio. So if you bring a public records request and win, you get your attorney's fees. So right. there are lawyers who actually make money, you know, uh, working this, uh, this, this idea. We, our own firm tends not to do that. We usually get enough information that we can go ahead and file our lawsuit and get our records with subpoenas after we file the lawsuit. We just don't like to waste the time uh, to litigate over public records. But, uh, but I would urge anybody who's getting the slow walk, to, if they're not involved otherwise in a lawsuit and they're just trying to, to learn the ropes, 
to go ahead and use uh, public records laws if you have them uh, to get the records you need. And there are lawyers out there that will be happy to do it, especially if you have a law like ours where you get fees if you win. And these are actually expedited lawsuits. In many cases, you can file directly in a court of appeals for a mandamus, which is a very fast track way of getting things done rather than lining up behind every other civil case in the country. And the reason that they're fast track is that uh, legislatures who have passed these laws understand that access to information is access to uh, the, the basic building blocks you need to have and exercise your vote. So, um, so I would just make sure you understand your own public records law and, and bust through the delay by going ahead and filing if that's what you need to do. In, but my question back to Iowa is, is there a particular problem that you've tackled in these various initiatives that um, like that, that those information requests or other things relate to. Uh, you talked a little bit about your diversion, your juvenile diversion. Is there anything else that you're working on with the police uh, that would reflect uh, a, a reform mode? Sure. The starting point for all of this, I think I shared with you, uh, was disproportionate incarceration within our systems. In Iowa, we are used to be the single worst state in disproportionality in the United States. Uh, we've got about 3% black population in Iowa. Uh, that represents 26% of our prison population, for example. We're eight to one on disproportionality in marijuana arrests, which was the ACLU report on it. And that filters down right into the school systems as well. Uh, so everything that I've been doing and the people I've worked with with in these different coalitions. Uh, that's the basic thing that we're addressing right now is disproportionality across the board. Um, one of the examples, I mean, we've had for years, the police and public officials will report that racial profiling is not an issue in Des Moines, what, which is a joke. Um, that's part of what the, the bulk of the document requests are literally Line by line, I took the Obama administration task force report that related to profiling issues. I took a series of answers that the police department gave related to that, and then basically said, prove it um, with the documents. Well, that's the documents I'm after. We've done one other thing that's related to it. The department also said they knew there was no problem because no complaints were being filed. Well, we've implemented now body cameras and, and Auto cameras, have been a while around, but body cameras about a year. Now, so we've now filed six complaints. Um, all of, and that system is totally opaque as well. So part of the requests are going to be make that transparent. And we have a law firm that's willing to, to file civil suits uh, on the police department where they can demonstrate actual civil wrongs. So we're going at it fairly aggressively right now all the while trying to maintain at least a talking relationship with the department. That help? Okay, well that's very, that's very helpful. When it comes to the racial profiling, is this a particular department or a whole bunch of departments? You mean in Des Moines? Yeah. Across the board. The schools, um, the profiling in the schools leads to about a two to one disproportionality in out of classroom suspensions, work like that. So we have programs that we've set up in schools with the complete support, by the way, of the school system, including mediation and restorative practices uh, with circle trainings, which we're doing. So the school system has been really good. It works into the juvenile court system, as you might guess, uh, as well. Uh, with the block that we got out of the legislature on juvenile court records, we've been stumped on that. But with the legislation that we just got passed, we will be able to attempt to work with the juvenile court divisions as well on similar programs. Uh, and then in the police department, as I said, we work. Um, I just reviewed part of my requests. I went to the Iowa Department of Transportation and I got 2017 records on traffic stops. Um, I haven't had a lot of, I haven't yet completed the work on them. I've 
about other people helping me. We have 16,600, for example, and I can demonstrate right out of the gate with just a couple of quick Excel spreadsheet works. Uh, there's more than a two to one racial disparity in Des Moines on stops of people of color. So it's across the board in Des Moines and largely denied. I mean, Des Moines, was, your school system, you're, you're pretty um, happy with their response and is it working? Is it reducing the racial disparity like in discipline or whatever the target was? Well, according to the records, they started with about a three to one disproportionality. We've got that down to two to one. So in theory, they're making progress. And then are there any police agencies that have uh, heard you and are, are there any of them doing any better on this important topic? Well, we've not really worked with any place except Des Moines right now because it's the biggest in the area, of course. And Des Moines basically simply is not going to make changes. It's real interesting listening to the work that's been done in Cincinnati compared to what we're getting back here, which is our county attorney's office has tried to block most of what we've done and the Des Moines Police Department has very little incentive to try to change. So it's hard work right now. Yeah, it is, but it sounds like you're really plugging in at a number of fronts. So that's, that's great, great effort there. So um, we heard uh, from Columbus that what they're sort of zeroing in on as a takeaway from uh, this um, webinar series is becoming a, a research arm for community activists that are going, that are, that are, um, that have been at this a long time. I'm curious from the other groups, um, what action items have you begun identifying uh, that you could pursue using some of the, um, uh, some of the stuff we've been talking about, or what, what's sort of your menu of options um, uh, that maybe you'd like to spitball with us a little bit. Can really respond to that. All right. Well, um, okay, okay, I'll start. I'll model not doing this well so other people will feel unintimidated. <laughs> Um, so in Minneapolis, we're a meeting behind or meeting, two people were sick last week, so we didn't meet before I left. But I mean, I think where we'd come to was this tangle of state, county, and city stuff and trying to figure out where we could have any impact. So I suspect when we meet the week I'm back from Mexico, that we're going to be looking through all of that to try to figure out where the community partners think we can have the most impact and, and jump in. Because we have the same police union problem somebody else mentioned. And the police union, not only has lawyers, but they have lobbyists, really good lobbyists that make state law about a bunch of stuff that impacts the city. So we're just trying to untangle all of that. I mean, I'd, I'd say our biggest learning is how much more complicated these systems are than I knew between the city, two cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, couple of counties and the state. So I, I just say that so that no one else feels intimidated by not knowing how to answer that question. Well, that's where we are with it. It's good work, important work. And a comment on that. Um, I could say something about our effort, if you want. Yeah. Where are you calling from? Um, from Dayton. Oh, uh, okay. oh, so somebody yeah. is there from Dayton. It's just a blue screen. Yeah, I got on late. I got on late. I'm sorry. Oh, so, yeah, our other two team members are out of town. Um, I don't have a lot to say, but I think it's more like I know where we need to head, which I think is to, um, and, and actually, you know, I think, you know, Al knows a whole lot more about what's needed in this area than we do. But, um, the Justice Advisory Committee for the Montgomery County Jail, I think is something we need to somehow decide. Should we ask to meet with them? Should we try to take an ask to them? 
or I mean that that the, that seems to be the area where something is needed is with the problems in the Montgomery County Jail, which you know Al identified early on, and um, we didn't send in a report on this, but one of the people that I talked to on the phone for our homework, you know, just right away, I just asked the general question, you know, Montgomery County um, Sheriff's Department, what is uh, what areas come to mind as needing attention and they just laughed like the jail obviously you know so yeah. um, I'm not sure if, an, if anyone has any guidance uh, about how we should approach that um, group. So, I mean I actually know one of the people on it personally so I, I can use that so this is an interesting uh, question because um, Montgomery County is uh, so, somebody needs to can you mute yourself there you go so um, this is a, um, a jurisdiction that has had huge problems at the jail there's been a lot of lawsuits that have been filed we have some of them and um, and in the, the response to that uh, some pressure was put on by the county commissioners and a commission was set up by the sheriff. And it's specific to doing something about the jail. This commission, I mean, first of all, you should research it. Who's on it? How did they get on? What power do they have? We were talking about this earlier with, with um, citizen uh, review boards. And so just because there's a body that exists doesn't mean, and this isn't news to any of you, doesn't mean that it's uh, meaningful. Um, my understanding of the one in Montgomery County is, uh, is that there's some problems and we should maybe talk offline a little bit about that. But my first piece of advice would be to read everything you can about it, find out what at the end that committee will be able to do, if anything, and what is, uh, what is the purpose? And how did these people get there? Um, and I think the overall uh, issue you're raising is important, which is uh, where do you plug in? And, um, and understanding the entities you're considering joining and working and supporting is the first step towards deciding whether to join. And that's why we started with the, you know, get to know your community and get to know your jurisdiction. And what may uh, was talking about with uh, coming to understand the intersections of all of these different jurisdictions is one of the most difficult things even for lawyers to understand. I mean, one of the first things you start looking at in law school is the different levels at which law is made and uh, how power is distributed throughout government. And, um, and so, uh, you know, untangling all of that is a huge burden. Uh, and, you know, you never get all the way through it. You learn a lot as you go along. So. One of the things that um, uh, relates to this is uh, another takeaway from Iowa. What Harvey was talking about was that he's got several projects going, some of which will piss off police people that he's pushing on. But at the same time, they're also doing this facilitated circle conversation which will engage uh, people at a much more um, civil level and maybe uh, allow for a type of conversation that needs to happen if people are gonna see themselves on the same team even though they don't necessarily come into things with the same ideas. So uh, maybe we could hear a little bit more about what, who's organizing those conversations and how, Harvey, you see them plugging into this broader effort, and then we'll get back, there's a question uh, that we'll get back to from Ellen as well. Mm -hmm. Can you go first? to talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, these all came out of a request that um, one of the groups that I work with uh, made to the Des Moines Human Rights Commission in the fall, late fall of 2016. We've been doing this work long enough, and we got we did a study of the Obama administration task force report, and we went to the Des Moines Human Rights Commission and said, "Here's the report. 
Here's what we think it shows. We would like you to investigate the Des Moines Police Department under the powers that you have and um, determine and come back with a report on whether or not our department complies with the recommendations of that task force report. Um, that was done for about nine months and then we got a report back, which basically was the police department taking the appendix of that report and highlighting it with a magic marker. We were not happy with that. Uh, it would be an understatement. What Joshua Barr, who was the director of the Human Rights Commission, then did, and he was planning this for about a year, um, he was trained at the Kettering Institute on a facilitated model circle process. Uh, so he took that model uh, and then used some of the questions that had been raised, and that's then the basis of these community circles that are about to happen. So they start in May. He's planning on having 10 circles, 16 people in each circle. The initial meeting will be two and a half hours, and then with follow-ups as necessary, as people will agree to. Um, and out of that model, uh, by fall of this year, his hope is that we will actually have concrete recommendations for systemic change in the Des Moines Police Department. And as I said, so, he invited me to be a part of the first one, which will include, right now anyway, the police chief, me, and the uh, county attorney, and then 13 other people who are all. And I suspect he will try to get the head of the NAACP, all of us at that level on it. So I'll have a lot more to report when we come back in June, and I can report two things. One, um, how those conversations are going, and secondly, um, what response I've gotten having filed the request for the demand, and I'll probably use it as a mandamus request uh, with it because I will also allow for the collection of fees. So anyway, the circles themselves, um, I'm hopeful with it. I guess the best I can say is that it will open some doors to dialogue that have not been opened. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks for that, uh, for that information. Alan, you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna um, I was gonna tell you what we're up to here, but um, I think I'm good. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Al, at our last webinar, you had said that you had some contacts in Cleveland that you thought we should get in touch with. So tell me how I can ping you to to remind you of that. Uh, shoot me an email, and I'll get back to you. Do I have your email on the? It's a Gerhard Stein, G E R H A R D. S T E I M uh -huh. at gbfirm.com. Okay, that's easy. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, so we, um, as a group, we um, have settled on looking at um, a local jurisdiction that's um, the city of Euclid, which is a um, an inner ring suburb outside of Cleveland, and. Um, you know, there, we feel a certain timidity, like it, it, it's not a comfortable thing to go, you know, waltzing into a, a, a city hall and, and confront people. So we've been sort of getting our ducks lined up. Um, and it's very interesting because it, um, it's, since it's not Columbus or Cincinnati or Dayton, um, in some ways that makes it easier and in some ways that makes it harder. Um, it's harder because they don't have a certain amount of infrastructure. Like, you know, in Shaker Heights, for example, they have like a, you know, a community relations officer who would sit down with you and, and you know, give you all the information you wanted. And they simply don't have that in Euclid. Um, Euclid is tied up in a number of really serious um, cases. Um, there's some litigation. They, they recently, about a year ago, there was a um, a death of a young man who started out by being asleep in his car and ended up being killed by an officer. Um, and that's in litigation right now and that the officer was not disciplined. Um, so um, we're lining up our, our questions for them. We're making alliances with people in the community um, and that's going quite well. And hopefully at some point we will be able to sit down and, and talk to them about you know, um, how they are about using the number of arrests as a metric for promotion and, and those kinds of things. And I guess ultimately what would be really great is if that community could be empowered to develop some sort of board, uh, a police community relations board. 
Um, so, but that, you know, it's a long way off, but we're, we're creeping toward that. And then I think Karen also had something she wanted to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Mine is, is really quite related to what Eileen has said that, and this may be simply my perception and better discussed within our little group, but I'd also welcome comments from uh, any or all of you that I sense a caution about actually meeting with people face to face. I think we have been doing a decent job of learning uh, the scope of the issues, what is possible, um, how we might uh, direct our inquiries, but so far the process has been to send a written list of questions rather than actually seeking out a face-to-face -face meeting. This may be just my perception and nobody else has a problem with it, but it worries me that it keeps people at arm's length and a face-to-face -face meeting where you see each other as real people, as human beings with hopefully mutual interests and concerns hasn't yet happened. So, and I, I just would like some feedback from you and then we need to talk about it within our group. So is this a, a are you saying that you've you've been reaching out for this face-to-face -face meeting and you've, re, you've felt resistance, or um, or you're considering doing a face-to-face -face meeting and uh, and and you're you're hesitating to do it? Well, the initial action was uh, there is someone within our group who has a good local contact within Euclid, and they did talk, but then. It never went further than that on a personal basis. Some of it is time constraints, but the, the, the secondary uh, action then was to do it by emails, which troubles me. Um, partly, I guess it's my own projection. I wouldn't, if I were the, on the police force, I would not respond very well to written request for information and never having met the person and had a sense of who they are and what they cared about and that they uh, were both trustworthy and serious. I think I'm guessing also that some of it is we want to be seen as more than little old church ladies. Um, we have a serious purpose. We want to hold each other accountable. Um, but somehow there's a reluctance to do this um, as, a, as a methodology um, in the way that we've been approaching this. Well, let's separate some of the tasks. Certainly getting data is best done in writing. And the public official uh, is wrong to think that data should be withheld unless people are serious and you know have any sort of judgment about who the re requester of the data is. It's not their business. Public records laws are open to everybody and everybody is equally available to get at them. So those should be in writing. But if you're talking about a dialogue around what the policing philosophy is, whether uh, there is some uh, opportunity once you've studied data to uh, reflect on the fact that you've discovered as they did in Iowa such dramatic disproportionate arrests and you want to start to get answers to that face-to-face -face is great and should be done and there's no problem with it uh, but understand that that one meeting isn't going to probably change anything either but I don't want to discourage anybody from having real human contact with the real human beings that are uh, setting policy on all these important <laughs> matters. Uh, but I just see a difference between record requests and substantive uh, reform ideas. 
if that helps. Yes, that's thank you. Personal parts of it. The thing, the main thing I've learned over these last seven years is building relationships has been critical at almost every step of the way. Um, the reason we got legislation passed this year is one of the people that was working on that with us had direct relationships with a very conservative head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. <laughs> Would have even talked to us, but he had just been sit down face to face meetings. Um, my relationship with the Des Moines police chief is an excellent. We disagree on all kinds of things, but he's happy to. Start. I don't know that he will sit down anyway um, on scheduled meetings. The the point of it being, I don't think that I have attacked the personal, you know, the people in any way. It's always been higher level conversations about process. Um, and what what's going on. And I think as long as I can do that with people and build relationships over time, um, that's how I think we're going to make some progress. It's also meant I've met people I would never have met before. I spent, I'm a Unitarian, I spent my Easter morning 6 o'clock service in a black uh, Bethel AME church here in Des Moines uh, because they're not my friends and extended family. So I would encourage you to get out and build the relationships with everybody you can. I, I have a question, this is Debbie in Columbus. Um, and it's a comment related to some of the things that Des Moines has been talking about. And then I'd, I'd like for you to weigh in on this, Adam and um, Al. Um, a couple of years ago, I called the Columbus Dispatch to the reporter who seems to be reporting on a lot of public school records requests, um, you know, sunshine law issues, and he was very helpful. Is there, are there ways rather than, we've been very lucky in Columbus in terms of public records requests, at least let's say, I as a white woman living in, Clinton, in a white area have been very lucky with it. But can the media help you? I found it that Columbus Dispatch, it seems like they, they're like a dog with a bone. If you tell them they can't have something that they're supposed to be able to have, um, they often uh, start some sort of legal process. What, what do you think about that, Adam and Al? Yeah, and that varies with the uh, uh, media outlet. Sometimes uh, the media outlet will give me uh, the results of their public records request just to speed things along. Others think that's proprietary information. Once they get it, they, are, they don't want to share it. I know that up in Cleveland, I was able to get many years of arrest data broken down by officer uh, that had been, you know, worked on by the, uh, by Sensei, or by Cleveland.com, uh, by the plain dealer. Um, and they were just forthcoming with it because then they wanted to turn around and get comments on it. Um, so it varies. And I would certainly nurture those relationships because they do a lot of public records requests and they do a lot of of research and they need uh, sounding boards uh, so that may well be a, a good a relationship to nurture in a, in a quick way uh, to get some insight on what the data is showing. Thanks. Yeah. Um, this is Catherine from Portland. I just wanted to um, say a few words about where we are and I think relationships is is largely um, what we're focusing on and also looking for a place that we can plug in. We have um, we have a large number and a, and a very um, diverse set of community organizations. We have a consent agreement, we have citizen review boards, we have a long-standing ministerial association based in our African-American community that has decades of respected work um, behind it. We have some very recent organizations, one of which, for example, is a, a, an organization, a small group of women who are actually the mothers and grandmothers of young African-American men who have been victims of police violence. So we have, we identified more than 20 organizations um, in this big mix, and we ad and then we chose five or six with um, to approach for telephone and in-person interviews, and we haven't yet had a chance to get together and debrief that initial set. 
Um, but we're, we've kind of said this is so important to our long-term work that we really need to understand our community. We really need to build relationships and we really need to be strategic because politically that's very complex. We're also trying to coordinate our efforts with our church's social justice outreach efforts to make sure that those that it's complementary. So we have um, strategically just decided to pause and really spend a lot of um, time and sensitive effort on understanding our community, choosing relationships and then potential relationships and then building those relationships for, for a future platform. So you're not pausing. You're actually doing a very important part of the work. And this is what uh, I was impressed by with Columbus as well. You know, we're talking about police reform. So we want to talk about who are the over-policed people? Who are the people who are the victims of uh, reactive policing? And inevitably, that's going to lead you to the 20 organizations or the five that you distill that are really closest to the ground level of people who are being oppressed. And in Columbus, they've already identified some of those. You're working on it in Portland. That's just the other half of this. I mean, you want to plug in both with the victims and with the perpetrators. So rushing right off to the police and trying to work directly with them without really being tethered to those who are victimized is going to make you less credible in any sort of organizing work. So I think it's great. I think that's a very, very necessary part of the effort. And if we never stress that, shame on us. I mean, my clients are the black organizations and the families of people who get shot. So I kind of take that as a given, but, but, but you're making us remember in this context that your talents need to be um, fed into the groups you're talking about, the, the, the victims of, of over-policing, and then um, supporting that community. Uh, and that's, that's a very, very important piece of this. So thank you uh, for doing that work. That's not a pause. Okay, thank you. And this is, go ahead. Well, I was going to say also in 2016, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission weighed in on a case in Columbus where two black officers said their lives were threatened by a crazy kind of rogue officer who was fired and then he's been reinstated. And every time I try to ask somebody about that case, they say it's pending and it's going to be a long time. I called the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. They say it's going to be a long time. You know, it speaks to the culture of the organization they were actually they, they were they filed a complaint against their supervisor because racial epithets were being used in in the office and one of the quotes from one of their supervisors was that's our culture here you know that almost like come on buddy what are you talking about what do you think about these commissions des moines mentioned the human rights commission i mean the ohio civil rights commission i don't understand how you can sit on a case for for uh, years, while uh, these officers left the state, of, one of the officers left the state of Ohio in fear of his life. He no, he no longer lived in Ohio because his life and family were threatened. So will you talk a little bit about these commissions and what they mean and what they don't mean? Well, I mean, this varies. I mean, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission is a state organization uh, that almost every state has, which is part of the whole movement for equal opportunity you know, laws, the civil rights laws, matching on the federal level with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So every state has one of these and it's set up with the staff and everything else. And it is appointed by whoever the, the, uh, the ruling political party is. So at different times in Ohio, uh, the commission has been pretty aggressive in, in uh, pursuing justice, and at other times it's been pretty sleepy. And I think that, you know, like anything else, you have to uh, be vigilant uh, about whether it's something you want to invest your time in, given the players. I think these um, ad hoc commissions, like the one you're talking about in Columbus, 
the one that was just talked about in Dayton, um, the, some of the groups that are forming in Iowa, those might have even more potential because they're on a short timeline, they're supposed to come up with recommendations, uh, somebody invested some political capital in creating them, uh, so uh, both the black community and those who are progressives in the white community could rally behind them and say, let's get this work done that we've all said needs to be done. Uh, so uh, if I were going to rank where to put my energy, it might be into these, these more recently framed commissions. But I'll tell you, there were 13 commissions in Cincinnati, uh, one that followed every police abuse uh, for over the years that I was practicing before we finally put an end to it and said we're tired of commissions that result in a binder with no action. Uh, so you have to stay vigilant, even if uh, you think that it's off to a good start. Uh, and that's, that's just you know, part of the work of, of organizing and, and staying strong. You know, we are in a very exciting time, uh, unfortunately built by tragedy. And since we last met, we had the shooting in Sacramento and a fair amount of national attention returning to our issue. And um, that isn't going to stop. So uh, we just need to find the best way in our own towns uh, to take that energy and make it more than witness. Thank you. So this is actually very helpful to have some time here where we can just talk about where everybody is at um, because we have another session not too far down the road here and then uh, gathering a GA. And this, this is our third session and it's helpful for us to, to detach ourselves from what we thought at the outset and think about how to resource you with um, where you're at now and what your next steps are gonna be. So I don't want you to feel like we're setting the agenda at this point. I mean, I think at this point, what we really want is for you all to be um, feeling resourced and able to go out and develop um, the agenda with your community partners. So we'll be um, putting our heads together here based on these conversations uh, about what we think could be the most productive use of our next session. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to check in a little bit about just where you're at and, uh, and what you think your next steps will be like, um, so we can take that into account. I think most people checked in. It looks like Harvey, are you trying to log back in? I see you leaning over. <laughs> This is Jen, and I my check in was through um, the rest of my group, Catherine and Elizabeth. I did ask in the chat to know if somebody from different groups was going to be at GA. As we think that through, yeah. So um, yeah. I appreciate people who are posting the answer to that. It's in Kansas City. If you haven't thought about it, I haven't been looking at the chat, so thanks. For yeah. Um, all right. Well, we well, yeah. I just wanted to mention that I want to back up what Adam's saying, and we we certainly want to be helpful to everyone, and and uh, you know part of our goal is to help you break this down into usable bite-sized pieces. So uh, if you have specific requests on how we can be most helpful going into the home stretch, uh, please let us know. And um, I do hope that having Iris. Uh, from the community side, which was just referenced uh, again today, uh, and then Maris from the police side uh, were helpful in terms of seeing the two different uh, aspects of this work and knowing that, you know, these are the two uh, sides that we need to plug into. Uh, again, we'll, we'll do whatever can help you most make those connections where you're at. And part of this may also we, we may need to bounce back and as you're moving forward and you're asking more questions and you're hearing more things 
If you'd like us to speak in more detail about some of the concepts at our first session uh, and some of the concepts that have come up along the way, uh, we can also do that because we sort of started with this huge brain dump uh, um, at a time when you hadn't gone out and started, um, uh, you know, well, some of you had, but, you know, uh, we've moved on from there. And if we need to circle back some, we can do that. And don't forget, we do have a reading list uh, on our website, the Police Reform Toolkit, where some of these concepts are uh, more broadly explained. And what I'll do is I'll get a reading list from Maris. She had some good concepts about crime science that I don't have on the list yet that we'll be sure to add over the next week. Um, Al and Adam, this is Ginny from Columbus. It, it, I'm sitting here realizing this is a long haul effort. We're not, nothing's gonna happen in a few weeks or months. So what I'd like to know is, can we continue some kind of relationship with you so that we can consult with you from time to time as we uh, move forward so that we're not just like dangling and wondering if we're on the right track. And I'll, I'll add to that because great minds think alike. I was wondering, <laughs> would it be, because I've learned so much from the two of you, but also from the other groups. Could we, if this has to end, which I'm sorry, it, it does have to end in June, but could it be quarterly or could it be twice a year or something where we check in on our progress? Well, I'll defer that to uh, the CLF, which has wonderfully organized this. Um, and we would, I think, you know, we can talk, but we would be willing to, um, to join in a community session from time to time down the road um, sure. as resources. So, uh, but I'll just say from the CLF, it, it, when I hear all the groups talking about the concrete work you're doing, it makes me incredibly happy and proud and that we could play this facilitative role to bring all this wisdom and to bring the group together. So I think something like a quarterly gathering and check-ins is a great idea. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, so we'll get with Meg and Kevin and, um, and, uh, and come up with an agenda for the next time around. And probably have another guest to join us as well, so. Um, then as we're closing out, I have closing words for us. And I also just want to remind everybody that the videos are recorded. So, and you have access to those through the email that I sent out to everyone. So if something comes up in between these sessions, you're like, wait, somebody said something. I don't remember what it was. There is the possibility to go back. They're two hour videos because these sessions are two hours long, but they're there. So I just want to remind folks that they exist. So with that, was there anything left to do? I didn't mean to cut you off, Adam, if there was. Oh, yeah. Great. Then I will close us out with words from Leslie Takahashi. They teach us to read in black and white. Truth is this, the rest is false. You are whole or broken. You who love, who you love is acceptable or not. Life tells its truth in many hues, but we are taught to think in either or, to believe the teachings of Jesus or Buddha, to believe in human potential or a power beyond a single will. I am broken or I am powerful. Life embraces multiple truths, speaks of both and of and. We are taught to see in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. Let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins. Let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than the monochrome, that a river of identities can ebb and flow over the static stubborn rocks in its course, that the margins hold the center. Thank you. 
You know, I, I hate to do this. I hate to go back into our uh, regular content after cosmic words, but those words made me think of something that I want to emphasize. Uh, we've had a couple of comments about how um, Columbus and, and I know Portland are talking to uh, black groups and other marginalized people. And we're reminded in these words about the importance of that. And I just want to uh, emphasize how sensitive and difficult that work is. Uh, right now, I am in the middle of promoting a uh, refresh, as we've talked about, of our own collaborative. And I'm comfortable talking to our city leaders about various reforms that we need to fix and do. But the black community in Cincinnati is in an uproar because uh, we just had a, an arrest of a 13-year-old that was tased and it's, it's got everybody all in an uproar. And we also uh, have a black city manager who's about to be fired and many people think unfairly. So, so the politicians aren't worthy of talking to. The, the, the bosses shouldn't be dealt with on an equal basis because they're unfair and discriminatory. And so just because you're talking uh, to people in the black community doesn't mean that then you're, that there's a natural linear path from the wisdom you've learned from your data searches back to the collaboration with uh, police bosses and, and politicians. Uh, there is a tremendous gulf uh, that gets more murky the, the deeper you, you get into uh, the, the communities that, that, are, that are hurting. Uh, so we have to tread lightly and listen long and hard. Thank you. Those are pretty cosmic words, too. <laughs> All right. Have Thanks, a good everybody. Night. See you next See month. Bye. 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 Bye.